Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to Prog Chattery 777, where today we will be talking about The Zealot Gene by Jethro Tull. This one came out in uh, early 2022. I remember, uh, I remember it quite well. It was a pretty active time in my life when this came out. Um, obviously quite notable. It's the first time that the Jethro Tull name has been used on an album since 2003 with the Christmas album. Although I found that kind of confusing, I mean, like all the like, you know the the lines b between Ian Anderson solo and Jethro Tull are very very blurry at this point. And I remember, like, it, the, you know, a lot of the journalists were making a real big uh, deal about how, oh, it's the Jethro Tull name, this is the first Jethro Tull album since Christmas album, da 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 but, I mean, really, this is just the follow-up to Homo Erraticus, is it not? I mean, it's the same band, um, you know, it's, and, and even, you know, the, previously on the Homo Erraticus liner notes, he does say quite specifically that, you know, the, any album, or any, any releases that come, um, you know, past 2014, he wanted to, to release as, uh, a solo album because you know just i don't know if the, the jethro tall name was worn out there was also the stuff with martin Barr, but um lo and behold uh, we do have uh, the album released as a jethro tall album i think he did that um you know the the you know band members that have been on tab two and uh, homo erraticus um had never been on a jethro tall album so maybe that was just like a, a, a thing of courtesy to, to give them the opportunity to say that they've been on a jethro tall album i'm not too sure it doesn't really matter that much i mean i still in a lot of ways i consider this to be the follow-up to homo erraticus it's kind of it's it's that same stream and like i said it's exactly the same band uh, with one very minor exception so obviously yeah you got ian anderson on uh, flute vocals guitar um, David Goodyear on uh, bass guitar, John O'Hara on keyboards, Florian O'Fall on um, guitar, Scott Hammond on drums, and then introducing for just one very brief moment is Joe Paris James on lead guitar. Uh, for just one track on this album, he would go on to be the full-time guitar player for a little while, and then I think since then they've actually switched again, so they've had three guitar players in the last uh, two or three years or so. Um, and then, yeah, the, uh, the, of course, the album, uh, I guess go, just go up, the, the album cover kind of makes me laugh, because again, this looks more like a solo album cover than either Tab 2 or, or Homo Erraticus, and yet it's got the Jethro Tall name, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but, uh, whatever. Um, this album does come with, uh, a concept. Now, it's not, I, I don't really feel this is a concept album in the sense of, like, you know, The Lamb or, you know, even Tab 2 or Thick as a Brick. Um, the concept seems to be more like a, a device for how he wrote the songs. So, and, and if I if I get the specifics incorrect, yeah, it is what it is. But it, it's essentially like passages from the Bible or Psalms are uh, are kind of extracted, and uh, each of the song applies each of the songs applies a uh, a modern day kind of take on whatever um, that that biblical passage is. Again, forgive me for for missing out on the details. I'm sure there's a lot more depth that I could extract out of this album by by diving deeper into that. But you can just as easily take this as just a nice collection of songs. Um, one thing that is really notable, and one thing that kind of makes it makes it sound more like you know a quote unquote Jethro Tull album, is the inclusion of uh, kind of shorter little acoustic numbers, which was always a staple of the '70s. Obviously, uh, Aqualong, Minstrel in the Gallery, those are good examples where lots of those little acoustic moments happen. Um, and that that's on this album as well, and I think it really benefits the album. It's kind of funny because I think that is essentially happened by accident. Um, obviously, the recording of this album took place when that particular bug was going around and uh, everyone had to stay inside. So um, as a result of the lockdown procedure, protocols, whatever, the band wasn't actually able to get together for much of the recording of this album. They were able to get a number of band tracks, but there's uh, several songs that are, it's just, uh, for the most part, you know, Ian vocals and acoustic guitar little embellishments by the band but uh you know they're they're not there's there's only about half of this album is full band arrangements and i think that actually really benefits it so the fact that they couldn't get together and some of the songs were just kind of left more bare bones kind of gives the album a character and it gives it a much more dynamic range as well um I think, you know, on the whole, his voice, which, you know, there's a video I've, I put out a long time ago discussing, you know, what happened to Ian's voice, but um on the whole, his voice sounds pretty good on a lot of this album, and I think that has to do with those acoustic numbers. It sounds a lot better when, when everything is stripped back and it's uh, it's a little more simplified. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll chat about the tracks then. So uh, obviously this one opens with uh, Mrs. Tibbetts. Uh, this is a song about uh, the unlucky bugger who had to drop the bombs on Japan during World War II. 
Um, and it's, uh, the, lyrically, certainly there's, there's a lot of interesting depth in there. Musically, it's quite interesting. It's, a, it's, an, it's an odd one to open the album. Kind of starts out with that nice little chipper flute line, which is, you know, kind of classic bit of Ian Anderson. And very quickly when the song gets in, we get those really icy, I mean, cold sounding keyboards. It's, you know, reminiscence of uh, Under Wraps, perhaps. Um, he's not singing like he was on Under Wraps, unfortunately. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a definitely very keyboard heavy, you know, band song. Um, voice sounds, you know, pretty okay on it for the most part. Quite involved arrangement too. It's got a nice middle section with uh, some kind of, you know, funny time changes and uh, um, yeah. I mean, the 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 band is certainly in uh, in full form there. Certainly, um, probably. I, I guess it's pretty reminiscent of uh, of a Homo Erraticus track. I would think. I mean, oh, Homo Erraticus on the whole. I mean. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a good opener. Uh, kind of a little proggier too. It's a longer song, almost six minutes. Uh, like I said, it's got a pretty involved middle section to it. So yeah, it's a, overall a good song. I'm just repeating myself here at this point. Uh, we move into Jacob's Tales, which has a, a fantastic contrast. So after all the icy sounds and synthesizers of the first song, we get acoustic guitar and a harmonica, which is fantastic. I love that contrast. And it works in the context of this sort of an album because, you know, obviously there's a history of Jethro Tull and there's, there's you know, there, there's those little acoustic numbers, there's the electronic stuff, there's bluesy stuff, and you can kind of, you can mix and match on an album like this, you know, so late in their career. Um, and Jacob's Tale is really good. It's, uh, I believe it's a song about kind of sibling rivalry. And uh, yeah, it's just one of those classic bits of just Ian and his guitar, some some of those harmonica harmonica embellishments, like I said, and uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a really nice really nice little track, and I think it uh, makes the album flow quite nicely. It's a nice contrast. Moving on to track three, we get "Mine Is the Mountain," another uh, I think some some folks have called this like almost like "My God," but uh, sung from the you know sung and written from the perspective of uh, someone who is much older than the Ian who wrote "My God." Um, Kind of, I mean, I don't know if I'm saying this wrong. It portrays God as being, uh, you know, kind of the the grumpy, grumpy man in the clouds. Just, you know, leave, leave me be. You know, be. I, 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 I don't want to go into too much lyrical analysis and embarrass myself. Musically, it is very, very good. Um, quite dynamic. It's very piano driven for the most part. It does have a couple of, you know, highs and lows. The vocals do suffer a little bit when the when the song tries to to leap out at you. Um, Da 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 ba da na finery. Again, don't have the lyrics in my head off the top of my head, but that particular, particularly the second time that that chorus comes, his voice does sound a little bit strained, which is unfortunate. But the the verse sections of this song, um, where he's he's singing, he's using utilizing the lower register of his voice quite a bit, does does work. I think it works pretty well. But another song that's it's pretty involved. There's you know a lot of changing parts to it. You know, fairly proggy for. Uh, for what it is, um, and yeah, it's uh, definitely definitely good. You also get the fal the falsetto uh, the falsetto vocals. Mine is the mountain. So he's still experimenting with uh, with his voice where he can, which is good to see. Um, and yeah, def definitely uh, definitely a good track, a good track for sure. Then we move on to the title track, the Zealot Gene. We get those synthesizers coming in again, that kind of cold synth synth work. Um, this this one I mean I think I think lyrically I was when it when it first came out I was I was just I was just so tired of it because everyone was was just sick of politics at that point I would think I certainly was at the time um, now I, I don't think you know I, I to to say that he was trying to go for a specific person I have no idea I mean there's one person that everyone would obviously like assume he's talking about but he seemed to backtrack from that in uh, uh, interviews and in the liner notes but I think he's, he's just kind of I think it's just an attempt to describe the political uh, climate at the time rather than a specific uh politician um and just that that kind of extreme attitude that seems to be in politics these days where you're either you're, you know if, if you're not on my side to the enemy and there's there's a lack of communication there's a lot of uh emotional reactions when it comes to certain politics and whatnot and uh, i th i think that's what he was trying to do i mean he typically doesn't uh go one way or the other in terms of politics but uh I mean, given what the climate was like at the time, it would have been too easy for him to go after a certain specific person. Um, musically, I think this song is absolutely fantastic, though. Like I said, it's kind of a return to those synthesizer styles. It is very riffy. Um, 
I thought that I, I thought that was really good, and um, his voice sounds pretty good on it. It's one of the full band songs where his voice does manage to keep up pretty well with the arrangement. Um, there's some funny lines of "Wasp right up the bum." That's a <laughs> that kind of make that kind of gives uh, gives everyone a laugh. Uh, it's got a nice little middle section to it. Uh, the weird little intro too. That pop 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 pop. The end is a little bit different too, where the flute goes up and the the uh, rhythm section goes down. But yeah, overall, I, I was definitely a big fan of the Zella Jean as a as a song. Good and riffy, and uh, even though the, the the lyrics were, you know, I was just over politics at the time. But uh, I, I I think as as an overview of uh, the political climate around twenty two you know two thousand one. Uh, or 2021 and uh, 2022, 2021 and 2022. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I think he does a good job of kind of capturing the overall vibe of that. Moving on, we get to uh, track five. This was the first single released uh, on the album, Shoshana Sleeping. Um, I don't know what it, what it was when I first heard it. I, I, I found it a little bit generic. It has grown on me a little bit. Kind of, it reminded me of of a song on Homo Eraticus again. I can't I can't say specifically which one, or maybe it was Tab Two. See, Debbie seems to be in that vein of those two albums. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 a good little rock song. The video that came out for it was pretty cool with all like the mass and whatnot. Um, this I believe this song kind of deals with intimacy uh, with your partner in the the older years, which uh, I can obviously cannot relate to that particularly. But uh, like I said, it's it's a decent enough song. It's got a good groove. Maybe it's a little repetitive. I think that's that's one thing that kind of bummed me out a little bit. But like I said, it has grown on me. Um, you know, I don't. Uh, I have no problems with Shoshana sleeping. I think it needs. I think it. It's like there's more energy in the track that doesn't quite come out. I think that that that's that's what that that could be one uh, one criticism. But uh, anyway, moving on, we get track six, "Sad City Sisters." This one I was very pleasantly surprised. This is one of, another one of the, the the quieter ones, the more acoustic numbers, and I very much get folk trilogy vibes from this one, um, especially with the 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 whistle at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, and it's yeah, I think it, it works really, really well. Seems to be about um, young ladies out, uh, you know, look, young ladies out partying or whatever, and looking for you know the answer to life's whatever. But I again, I'm not, I'm not much of a lyrical analysis when it comes to this stuff. Probably less so than I was when I was making videos regularly. But um, I thought Sad City Sisters overall was a really good song. I think the the musically it was uh, quite refreshing. It was nice to hear that. Uh, Again, that folk trilogy vibe, because that's not really present on Tab 2 or um, or Homo Eraticus. I mean, even, you know, kind of going back further to uh, Secret Language of Birds or Rupee's Dance, it kind of kind of has a, a connection to those as well. But this is definitely a highlight of the album for me. Definitely a fan. Uh, about uh, past the halfway point, we get Baron Beth, Wild Desert John. Uh, this one I, I I really like quite a bit. This is uh, it's a shorter song, but it could be the proggiest on the album. There's a lot of different parts to it. Um, it's it's like that, that that really nice intro as well. It's almost kind of start and stop. Da 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 da. And then it goes into the 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 main riff, which is kind of like a more you know traditional straight ahead rock thing. Um, Voice sounds pretty good. He's doing some of the background vocals a little bit. Not as not as dramatic as under wraps, but uh, you do get kind of get that call and response thing during the verse. I really like the middle section. Again, I get I get folk trilogy vibes, particularly like uh, the middle section from Fires at Midnight and uh, Weathercock. That middle section for uh, Baron Bethwell Desert John. That that's that that that's kind of a classic Jethro Tull thing. Like I said the song is only. Like uh, what is it? Um, it's only three thirty-seven, but there's a lot of music to it. Like I said, it's even though it's a shorter track, it's possibly the proggiest on the album, just in terms of the number of bits in it. And uh, yeah, another uh, album highlight for me. Uh, we move forward to the betrayal of Joshua Kind. Um, this is probably the most explicitly biblical one, I would think, uh, with Joshua Kind being uh, playing the role of Jesus Christ. I one would assume. Um, and this one's okay. I mean, it, 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 I, I, when I first listened to the album, I remember Baron Beth and Joshua Kind were kind of like it seemed like a, a pair of songs. But this one, this one definitely isn't as um, uh, it, it is, it's not as well arranged as Baron Beth Wild Desert John. It's it's a bit more repetitive. 
It's got a great theme that but da 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 ba ba da But I think I feel it just it does that one too many times or or something. There's something about it that just it's or maybe it should be developed a little bit more. Overall, it's 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 a decent enough song, but not as not as good as some of the other ones on the album. Uh, now we get to this is actually my favorite part of the whole album. I think this is the highlight of the entire album. Tracks nine, ten, and eleven. It's a it's a trio of um, a trio of the smaller, you know, more dynamic, quieter uh, acoustic numbers. Um, and I think they are absolutely fantastic. This is this really harkens back to kind of classic Jethro Tull again. I reminds me, you know, maybe, maybe like parts of uh, Baker Street Muse or. Um, you know, other stuff from Minstrel in the Gallery, Aqualung, or where those acoustic numbers were, were pretty prominent uh, in that era. Um, and the first of the three is, of course, Where Did Saturday Go? Very pleasant song, pleasant melody. Um, again, his voice sounds so much better in the context of just the acoustic guitar. Um, you know, you, obviously, he's, he's never going to sound like he did before, but when, he's, when, when it's in that, uh, that situation... It's it sounds fine to me. It doesn't it doesn't sound there's no straining, you know, it's it's a pleasant enough melody. It's not a crazy melody, you know. Where did Saturday go? I have getting carried away here. Um but yeah, I guess it, what did what did he say? This is a song about uh, just a, a missing a missing day in in a week. If you if you when you lose when you lose track of uh, of what's going on again, it, I think the the acoustic setting suits that quite well. Um, and then this leads us to uh, three loves three, the second of these three little acoustic numbers. Um, and this is a really nice one as well. Very pleasant. A um, little bit more lush and a little more range. I think there's there's more going on than uh, the first one. Uh, where did Saturday go? Um, but yeah, again, very pleasant, kind of a chipper, you know, it's, 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 it's poppy, but it still has, it's still very much the, um, the Ian Anderson acoustic guitar song thing, which he's done so well. And so we've had so little of since Rupi's Dance, really, um, which is cool. And this, this, uh, this track actually segues directly into In Brief Visitation, which is, uh, another really good one. This is a, it's still acoustic, but it's much more dramatic than the first two. Um, and this is where we actually uh, get introduced to Joe Parrish James, uh, the new guitar player, who just he just kind of follows along some of the flute lines, does a bit of lead guitar work. You know, sounds very. I feel most most guitar players that come into Jethro Tull. I mean, let, let's be let's be honest. They're 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 not going to go too far beyond what what Martin Barr would do. Um, yeah, that, that's you know Martin Barr has set the style and will 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 forever be recognized as setting the guitar style of Jethro Tull. No disrespect to uh, Florian or uh, Joe Parrish James, of course. But uh, brief visitation is really really good as well. Again, like I said, a little bit more dramatic. Um, his voice again sounds good. Like all three of these acoustic numbers, his voice sounds uh, sounds really really good. Um, I think this is. I think lyrically, I think this. I get the idea. This is about being um, the party pooper type person, which is kind of funny. Which uh, Ian, Ian Anderson, Ian Anderson has always considered himself very much to be that. Even back in his uh, in his twenties, he was uh, oh bed bed by ten o'clock, up early in the day, and we're gonna you know he he was a hard working bloke, we'll say. I think uh, brief visitation seems to be uh, about that. Uh, and then we move on to the final track of the album, The Fisherman of Ephesus, which he, he's got a penchant for ending his albums with a march lately. So at least at least Homo Eraticus is, is very much, it's kind of got a driving march feel to it, and so does this one. Um, what is the last song on um, uh, Cold, the Cold Dead Reckoning? That's the last song on Homo Eraticus. Uh, I think that one's a little bit better than this one, but um, this is still a fine track, obviously. Um, it's funny. It doesn't. It it doesn't quite. You know. It, it is a full band piece. It does. The album does finish with the full band, but it doesn't have the uh, heaviness of a Mrs. Tibbetts or Zealot Gene or uh, you know Baron Beth Wild Desert John. It, it seems it's 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 a march, but it's quite light and like the especially like the the flute line that kind of comes around in the back. Dun 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 dun. dun. Yeah, that that's that, that's kind of the the guitar riff. Uh, Bum ba dum bum 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 ba da 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 stuff like I didn't get it quite right, but you 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 know what I mean. You've heard the album, obviously. Um, yeah, overall it, it's it's a it's a probably one of the lightest full band tracks on the album. Kind of an unusual one to to finish on. I the the ending is weird too. I mean, it's kind of got that big build up and then just a, a sudden ending, which uh, 
Ah, uh, you know, it's uh, th that's the choice he made. It's uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, it's unusual. I think I probably would have preferred just finishing with those three acoustic pieces and have the album start heavy and then slowly, you know, become more intimate. But uh, eh, what I can't complain that much. Overall, like I said, this is a this was a pleasant surprise. I do think I like it more than Homo Eraticus or Tab Two. Um, and like I said, I'm comparing it to those two because, you know, even though, yes, it's the first time the Jethro Tull name was used since the Christmas album, this is clearly a part of the same trajectory that Tab 2, Homo Eraticus, uh, this one, and of course, um, Rock Flute as well, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. That one, um, I, I think this is better than Rock Flute. I'll give, I'll give that much away. I, you know, Rock Flute's got some good stuff on it, but uh, I think this, this hits the mark a little bit better. But uh, we'll talk about Rock Flute at another time. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I know it's been a long wait. It's been years since I've done any Jethro Tull content. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. And, um, yeah, stay tuned for more videos when I can do them. Take care.